Welcome to Midlife Crisis, another episode of Patroma Therapy. Today we're going to be discussing the concept of crisis, what could be good, what could be bad about it, how we can get around the anxieties, and how we how we look at the various crisis in our life. Is that the plural for crisis or is it crises? You tell me. Okay, so what do you understand when you hear the word midlife crisis? Maybe it's a midlife crisis, uh, whatever that is, when uh, a person's ambitious uh, hopes and expectations run up hard against, you know, reality. <laughs> there you go. Like, um, so, go ahead. So. Yeah, so it's not like Sisyphus getting up every morning and rolling the hill, the rock up the hill, and then it rolls back down. I kind of see the midlife crisis as a, a mountain. There's the the inclined plane of when you're building your life and you're going to school and you're getting your degree and you're getting married and finding out about life and relationships and you get a house and a car and kids and a dog. And then you've kind of reached the summit of the mountain, which is all of your material possessions. And then you look onto the other side of the mountain, the slope down, and it's just like a slow grind to death. What, uh, yeah. what, uh, what, the Sisyphean, Sisyphean work, uh, I don't think it deserves the dignity of a label of a midlife crisis. Uh, no, Sisyphus was too cool for that. <laughs> exactly. It was like search for novelty. Right. And thrill. What? Well, well, you know, if you think about, let's just take the, the number 100 because it's a nice number. You know, some people, you know, they say that women live longer than men. Different countries have different life expectancies. Let's just take the number 100. And let's say that, you know, we live in 25-year increments. You know, the midlife crisis numerically would hit around 50. But I've I've heard of people having their midlife crisis early, like the big one early. And I mean, there's different crises that occur along our life's journey, but would you say that you're having a midlife crisis? And that's maybe, why you've come to therapy? Maybe. Do you remember I told you about my dream that I have this recurring dream where I'm about to graduate from college, right? All I have to do is just to walk across the podium. Do you remember that? I told you that I had this awful yes, dream. Yes, and, and the last your second, classmates were laughing yeah, at you or I, something. At the last second, I realized I failed to submit my like, senior thesis and uh, I cannot graduate. I don't know why I have this dream, but uh, maybe like I'm panicking when I wake up, right? And uh, the same, the plot is always the same. And um, um, Anyway, I think that's maybe uh, that's uh, have something to do with that uh, midlife crisis I'm going through. Well, you know, we did have an, an episode in season one about about dreams, and we had an episode about Sisyphus rolling the rock up. But yeah, you did talk about that, and I think you know, graduation from high school, graduation from college, or you know, passing your medical medical licensing exam or your you know legal licensing like these these big exams that we take are filled with so much anxiety because like your parents are looking at you and your maybe some aunts and uncles are coming to the ceremony and your colleagues are going to be there and like the slightest thing can go wrong like you know your the proctor or your your you know supervisor says you know be sure you turn in this form and you like you forgot to turn in the form and the, they don't have your name on the diploma so Right, and uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe that fear that I'll never accomplish something uh, from my to-do list, uh, like, you know, that the novel maybe that I was going to write or maybe I was going to create some kind of, uh, write some kind of a book uh, or uh, a host a talk show, like, uh, for the sake of the argument. And, uh, yes. right, yes. maybe it's a midlife crisis that uh, doesn't take a psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst to see that... Um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, these these different sort of dreams that become embedded in our mind, they become kind of touchstones for continuing, you know, continuing problems. Uh, you know, I 
I have these dreams of I've been called into the principal's office of the department chairman. So, you know, as a professor or teacher, you know, there's performance reviews and then the, then they're like called into the principal's office and you never know if they want to talk to you about a student or if you're not going to get the right classes or maybe your contract's not going to be renewed. So anytime you get like, I mean, nowadays everybody gets everything through email or text or something, but you know, some time ago, they would actually have in the faculty workroom little boxes, little wooden boxes, and there would be a note in there. It was a pink note folded in half. And you could look at anybody else's note because the, it's not secure. It's just little open, like little pigeonhole boxes. And the, the notes never said anything good. It was like, please see me at 3.15. Like that's the worst thing you can ever read because like classes are out at three that gives you time to lock your door and come down and I mean it, it was it just produces so much anxiety and mm. I think that as we go I, I know as I've gone along in life and taught at different schools you know that that's been like a recurring anxiety yeah you, I've, also, I've also heard go ahead you mentioned uh, the age 100 and uh, and then 50 and I thought that uh, I was going to ask you if you think that uh, is that the age when uh, misery maxes out at like at, at 50? Misery? No, misery is available and in, in, in full supply all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was sent to I, I, I was I was sent away to a boarding school because there was no English speaking uh, school where we were stationed overseas. And so there was a lot of anxiety, you know, I was in a different country and I was going to be away from my family. And then, you know, marriage is full of anxiety and like, you know, having a kid is, you know, a pack of fun. But I know, you know, if you think about different people that, you know, and in, in my personal family of origin, we have some Italian ancestry and those women live to be 89 88 90 my grandmother lived to be 99 years old these women knew how to live hmm. i mean oh, i don't i don't do you think you're going to make it to 100 <laughs> i absolutely not but uh, really? you mentioned that how long they lived and i thought damn what uh, what if like Midlife, okay. What do you, what what comes before that? Quarter life crisis, or after that, uh, two thirds life crisis, or? Well, yeah, I think the quarter life crisis is like you're about twenty five, and like you, you got married, you got this decree, and then like, they have this thing called the seven year itch, which means like you've been married seven years, and you're wondering like, was this right? Am I staying with this? What am I gonna do? Why did I choose this career? So I think the quarter life crisis is questions about your relationships and then also about your your job choices. But you know, er Eric Erickson is a psych, you know, developmental psychologist and he talks about the different ages of man, the ages of human beings and you know, mm -hmm. Abraham Maslow uh, Maslow also yeah, I, I, uh, I know, you know, I know development. Yeah. And I guess there's like uh, anxiety and challenges but i don't know my grandmother was like always so cool like all my old italian aunts they were like always so relaxed how about they your... also drank well, <laughs> way to go grandmother <laughs> what uh <laughs> what about your grandfather because it's always about me i'm looking at this from main's point of view and uh, you mentioned before that yes. some men go buy a little red sports car but uh what I do, which uh, because probably I'm a total failure, I just took my uh, skateboard and uh, show off all tricks in the skate park. Does that make me like <laughs> <laughs> not going through midlife crisis? Well, you know, I think it is it is showing that your body can still perform. Like you know, traditionally, I suppose skateboarding or riding a motorcycle and stuff they, like that is often associated with with you know a different age but I, I mean it's the same thing for like a woman like going out dancing or going out and doing different sorts of things like you just you you want to feel like your body can still keep up even though you're you know there, there are signs that may, maybe maybe it can't yeah I, i've always heard that the midlife crisis for men is buying a car a sports car 
and then getting arm candy. So getting into some relationship with a woman who's like really good looking and you know, she likes you because you're a little bit older and you've got money and you're spending a lot of money on her. So for men, it's related to like money. And then the midlife crisis for women, as I've understood it, is you know, you've got your husband, you've got your house, you've got your kids. It's just like so boring that you decide you'll see what else is out there and you'll go wrangle yourself a, a young fella. Mm. <laughs> what I like, what I, so, what I like, um, how I like to deal with this is uh, not about the car probably, but uh, feed, feed my spiritual side I, uh, and uh, try to be surrounded by nature. Uh, I go to my summer retreat very often to stay alone for a while and uh, these kind of Buddhist things which... Uh, oh yeah, like try to be more in the moment, like appreciate the bumblebees around you appreciate exactly the instead of, in the instead forest, of looking over my watch shoulder the clouds yeah right all the time i just i'm trying to live in the moment and enjoy the wind uh, in my in my hair it makes me feel alive and um, yeah instead of that looking at my step or stopwatch all the time well you know i'm i'm, I'm feeling even more relaxed as you're talking about that i i live in the city and we we have a lot of community gardens where you know, you pay a small fee and then they give you a, a little small piece of land to, you know, grow to, you know, tomatoes, potatoes, squash, all, you know, and, the, and then there's some areas where you can go in there and clip, you know, different things like rosemary. So there's one, uh, there's several near where, where I am in Dallas around uh, the lake. And I always find that it's relaxing to go there and just like clip different things. And I come home and maybe I'll make a you know, make a rice dish that has some fresh rosemary in it, or I'll make some potatoes that has rosemary. Yeah, those those are those are nice things. But of course, then I'm sad because I don't have my house anymore, and then I'm just a little bit depressed. But you know, then I then I have a beer and I, uh, and I feel better. <laughs> well, we <laughs> I, agree. I think we drinking are. goes along with. <laughs> I think drinking goes along. I just I know that my uh, great aunts. You know, they were very old world, which is like European. They were not Americanized and they wore dresses and they were they would go to church and they were very prim and pro proper. But in the afternoon, they would have something called merienda, which is just a little afternoon snack. And they would have sherry and little tiny cookies. And they would make for me like a oh an ice cream float. And I just remember that that was very nice. And then my, my grandmother on a very, very hot day, she would go out into her garden and cut these little tiny, super hot peppers. And then she often had cold beer and she would pour just like a little tiny bit for, for me and my sister. So, well, yeah, well, I think, yeah. you know, being in nature, being in the present. But drinking is a great way, I think, drinking responsibly, responsibly of course, to, to adjust, great way to adjust you know, your lifestyle to fit your emotional needs. Because, you know, if you like buy a red new Porsche or a Ferrari or do some kind of other drastic and uh, like detrimental changes in your life, that will definitely to cause havoc, havoc. That's true. That's true. Well, I've also noticed during this pandemic we have going on like you know, many uh, the, the bars, the restaurants, the museums, the parks, pretty much everything has been closed down. But uh, uh, the liquor stores are open, gas stations, grocery stores, car repair. So as I drive along, I will see the parking lot of the liquor store. And generally before the pandemic, it's people coming out with a couple of people coming out with like just cases of beer, cases of vodka, cases of I don't know. I, I guess they're 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 having friends over. Maybe maybe they're drinking more. I don't know. It, it it's it's puzzling. And and a lot of these people are kind of kind of middle age because it's an area where there's beautiful houses and kids and dogs and cars and all that. So, do you think people are drinking more in in Russia during the pandemic? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, there is this stereotype about Russia that everybody is doing nothing but drinking. I think that's exaggerated. Uh, I see more and more people like gym is the new vodka. Okay, everybody like take care of their oh. health and uh, stuff like that. And uh, that's how things are. Everything changes, and I'm just I'm not keeping up, really. 
With your drinking or at, with your gym? With changes. Oh, okay. Well, you know, here they shut the gyms down. Oh, they um, did, yeah. I and, Absolutely. Yeah, I they, traded my gym membership for the Jack Daniels uh, a long time ago. <laughs> Well, I sometimes go up to the this gym that it's built on a hillside, and you can still walk around the parking lot. There's a lot of real, real pretty flowers and bushes and trees, and you know, do a few push-ups against the back of your car. But it's you know, doing exercise in isolation is not the same thing as you know, like you're on the stationary bicycle or you're watching other people. Like there's a certain momentum of being inside of a gym. Like you just feel like you know, I'm being really amazing. Like I have my water bottle. I've got my towel. Like my life is great. Like being with other people motivates you. Whereas just going by yourself and walking around the parking lot and do, doing push-ups against the back of your car, like it's not very inspiring. Hmm. Well, you know, I think we've come to the end of this episode of the midlife crisis and we've got some tips for you. We, we thank our subscribers for listening. And if you have any ideas, you know, please, Please, uh, you know, make make some comments. So, what what would you like to say in closing? Uh, stay woke, stay woke, everybody who's listening. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.